turn to the book of Job. Book of Job. Uh, I started preaching there last week and uh, preaching a series out of the book of Job. And I'm going to preach uh, the second message to that uh, today. And, uh, and some of them a little different because uh, we, uh, we talked about Job's trial uh, and the things that God had placed on him last week. And, and I sort of want to look at the life of Job and who he is. And even next week, we'll look at how uh, his life was uh, uh, affected by others. And uh, sort of an interesting topic. We all deal with sometimes how others uh, affect our lives and all that. And Job had some, some friends, and uh, they came to see him, and, uh, which on one hand was good uh, because they wanted to comfort him. Uh, that just may not have been the best of comfort. So uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll take a look at Job's friends a little bit next week. But this week, I uh, wanted to, to look at Job, and uh, I've entitled our series, A Tested and True Servant. And today I want to look at the state of Job's heart. You know, Job was in a special place when he started with all this, and uh, a place that you would almost think, well, he was above the be- the rest or even the most, we might say, lived a good Christian life. And yet God brought up, but God did and used him as a great example for us and all others who would have the word of God all after that. But he used Job. And uh, we're going to look at a few things about Job this morning that were said about him and think on those things this morning, because I think it can be an encouragement to us. And if we need a pattern of, you know, hey, there's someone we are to Think on and follow and how he lived. Job seemed to be one of those men. But Job chapter 1, we'll read uh, verses 1 through 8. And then we're going to look at the life of Job and the state of his heart this morning. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And there is for that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And so this morning I want to look at the state of Job's heart. Let us pray this morning and ask God to bless his word. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the day, for what you've given to us. Thankful for the time we had in Sunday school. And Father, for the fellowship and the, the singing of the great hymns. And Lord, we're again just thankful for all parts of our service, the prayer time and Lord, we just ask now that you might bless the preaching of your word. I pray for your help this morning. I ask that you might fill me with the power of your spirit. I pray that you might help me to encourage and uh, to give out your word. And may it be a, uh, may it meet the needs of each and every heart this morning, Lord, whatever they are. I ask that you'll just help those that hear it. That, again, it might encourage, it might uplift them, Father, as we look at this one in scripture who was uh, tried and uh, came forth as gold. Father, uh, again, may we learn some things from his life. We ask that you'll bless in the class in the back and just uh, encourage and meet the needs of those kids. And Father, again, we just give you all the praise for all that you do. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Job, again, stands out as one of those uh, interesting characters of the Bible. And by that simply meaning, and I guess uh, sometimes we don't like to call them characters. I I, I don't like any of the words that maybe give... Uh, any type of reference to something that some might seem fictitious because uh, Job's one of those that we think, well, surely to goodness that didn't happen, as the Bible said, to one man in one day. Because we read here that his family, uh, his family, his livestock, his uh, household, his servants, all that taken from him in a day's time because God said, 
you can tempt him. You can test my servant Job and gave that permission to Satan. Satan said, you put a hedge around him. Take that away. Let me touch this stuff. Job will curse you. He'll curse you. He'll leave you. He'll, uh, he'll just do that. And God said, you can touch him. Satan comes back. And uh, as we read in chapter eight, it's like you, you put a hedge around his body. Let me, uh, let me touch his body. And he said, if you do that, and he said, if I can, uh, can do that, that again, he said that, uh, that Job will curse him and that he'll do that. And uh, so Satan uh, was allowed to touch his body. And uh, because that, and Job still yet did not curse God. He uh, didn't sin. He didn't charge God foolishly, as said in Scripture. And uh, he would have boils all over his body that he would scrub with a pot shirt. Even his wife would tell him to uh, curse God and die. And so Job uh, didn't find a lot of encouragement as he faced the trials and the things that God would allow to come into his life. And as we looked last week, he would come forth as gold, as it said, and he would be tried and God would restore him and those things. And we'll, we'll look more at some of Job's life and some of those things in particular. But I want to think about who this man was. And we read in Scripture as it starts off that uh, Scripture gives us a detail about him and it gives some descriptive words. And you'll see them repeated twice in our text in verse 1 and verse 8. And it says some things about him. And we see that Job was, was really just worthy to be chosen for this part. So often Christians think, well, you know, those who've walked with God so much. And, and again, we base it on things we see in this world, don't we? We look at some of those folks and we think, well, you know, that's a, a good Christian. And how do we do that? We base it on what we see. We base it on what we know. And again, that is what we have. And, uh, and a lot of times if we're able to talk with somebody, we base it on their heart maybe and what we know about them. And we think, well, well, you know, if you've come to a place maybe a serving God or doing that, because again, the world sometimes looks and says, well, God's not going to punish you like this. God's not going to make you go through certain things like that. But yet you find in Scripture a lot of times that it was His chosen ones that God, for whatever reason, put much upon. You know, I oftentimes refer to the Apostle Paul. We know so much about him in the New Testament. A lot was placed on him. He carried a lot. And he carried it well, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, just to see how he dealt with uh, the problems that God gave him, whether they were physical problems, whether they were uh, church problems, where they were just journeying problems. I mean, uh, logistic problems to going where he wanted to go. God said, I'm going to wreck this boat here. You'll live. They'll live. And it set Paul aside, but he, God had a reason for it. You may not always know that reason. Job would come out of his trials and Job for nothing else that uh, he was to be tested and he was to be tried because God said, have you considered my servant Job? So what a man that he was. And uh, let us again understand the trials and tests. God allows some of those things and he allows them for a reason. As we mentioned that Job was refined a little bit, made a little pure as a, as a, if you looked at gold and what it comes out in its raw form. And God was making something beautiful out of Job. And for us, we have a book of encouragement uh, recorded in the scripture that when we read and we see things about Job and all oh, we can think that God was with him, God helped him, God brought him through, Job came through that, that hopefully it gives us some help that we can come through the trials that we face. Job was tested. He would have a testimony about it and he'll triumph in the end of this book. And what an amazing book it is. And as we said, Job and his contacts with his friends uh, will uh, discuss a few of those in some sermons to come and some of the other things. But today we want to consider the state of Job's heart. And I want to give you some qualities he possessed. As a matter of fact, uh, some of those we read through in Scripture this morning and a couple others, Job's only found in this book, and with the exception of two other places in your Bible, and we'll look at those Scriptures this morning. You'll only find his name recorded two other books of the Bible, but you find him here. And uh, we find this book, his name, uh, if you look him up in the concordance, uh, it's mostly recorded in the book of Job, two times in the book of Ezekiel, and once in the book of James. It's the only places you'll find Job's name written in the Bible. But let us look at this guy, because he does stand out as what, and notice what God said about him first in verse 1. Matter of fact, these first four were right there in verse 1 and verse 8. And he said that Job was a perfect man. 
oh, we uh, we don't like that. You know, there's some groups out there that they uh, they want people to achieve some kind of sinless perfection. And then most of us as uh, preachers, we preach, oh, you can't be perfect. And uh, you're a sinner. You're not going to be perfect. And that's exactly how it is. We are sinners. Uh, we hope to live uh, some things. But again, when we see that word perfect in the Bible, because you'll see the number of times connected with people, sometimes connected with things, talking about it being perfect. Uh, we, we have sometimes a different understanding of that today because we think, oh, it's perfect. Like there's no wrong at all with it. It's not necessarily what the word means there and that it's meaning uh, that, it, uh, you know, that it doesn't have like any mistakes in that. In this particular place, it talks about Job being perfect. He's complete. He's full uh, of everything. It means actually to complete, to make full. It means entire. Something with all its parts. He was together. And Job was just a complete person in the Lord uh, serving him. You know, uh, I don't know if you've ever had something that maybe didn't work quite right. I've probably got a number of things <coughs> like that. Uh, you know, and, uh, and that, but, uh, you know, something that all its parts just don't seem to work right. And I don't know if you've ever had a watch or a clock that maybe one part of it didn't move. And usually somebody could go in and fix that if they knew how to repair that. Some people might be able to do it. One of the little mechanisms was not right, but you might have one hand that is stuck and the other would move around it. Sometimes if they have maybe a little second dial, certain parts of those things would quit working. Probably just uh, a little intricate part on the inside, especially if it's a watch. It's sort of amazing if you've ever uh, seen anybody tear those apart. I've, I've never actually tried, but uh, those people who can repair uh, those things, they're, uh, you know, they're quite amazing little mechanisms. Uh, when you look, and they're small, of course, today a lot of things that went to electronics, but when you look at some of the older ones and just all the parts and things that it had and what they do to complete time. But obviously when something doesn't work completely right, uh, something's wrong with something in it. So it wouldn't be perfect, as we would say, even fitting the scale of the Bible word perfect. But Job was like something that was working in unison and something that they could say was perfect. You see that word in Scripture a few times, and uh, we even see it recorded in some of the other uh, poetical books about something being uh, perfect and having, again, some language concerning that. Psalm 37 and verse 37, I'll uh, flip over there in my Bible and uh, read that to you. But concerning uh, perfect things and concerning one who had that quality said, and this said, Mark the perfect man and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. You know, Job, because he was considered perfect in the Lord, was a man walking in the peace of God, a man walking in all that he could have, serving the Lord with what he had in his life. Job was considered a perfect man, a complete put together man. When God looked at him, he was that. Secondly, the Lord said, he's upright. Have you considered my servant Job? Perfect, he's upright. And uh, again, when we think of something upright, we again, you know, your mom corrected you when you were sitting and you like to slouch as a kid. They, you know, they wanted you to sit up straight and do that and um, figured someday you're back and have a big old curve and probably does today because of that because that's the way kids sit or some adults sit that way. But uh, we do think of something that is upright. We think of something that's straight, right. In this case, being upright as an attitude, it's righteous. We've seen that in verse 1 and verse 8 as well. But Job was considered an upright man. He was considered a righteous man. And, and again, that righteousness I'll discuss a little bit later uh, because I'm going to look at that as a separate category, but it's how we define that upward, that, uh, that upright word. But Job, again, when you look at it, he's perfect, he's upright, he's just somebody who does the right thing, and he's got that. If we had met Job today on the street before his trials, if we knew Job, Job would be that guy that would say, there goes a good man. There goes a, a, you know, a, a good Christian man. And probably one who, uh, again, did things the right way. He wasn't uh, a shady character. He wasn't uh, something else. He was just a good man. And we might say that in our vernacular today about Job. Job was a perfect man, according to Scripture. Not sinlessly perfect, but perfect. But he was upright as well. Thirdly, and there's seven of these, so I'll move through a couple of them pretty quick. But it said that he feared God. And God said that about him, that he feared God. You know, uh, so often today, those kind of statements 
really draw a uh, a lot of uh, uh, again a sort of uh, uh, they draw a lot of conversation maybe with people, especially as Christians. Oh, we shouldn't fear God. You know, they we want to look at it. And matter of fact, a lot want to paint a picture and they use some of the names in Scripture. And uh, and again, they're not entirely wrong saying that God is our loving Heavenly Father because He is. And we shouldn't fear that. But the fear that's talking about is not being so afraid that God sits up there, you know, going to throw a lightning bolt at us. That's always everybody's fear. You know, God's going to strike me down with lightning. Can He? Of course He can. Uh, could He do those things? Of course He can. In Scripture, He did a number of things like that. He moved upon people. I was reading the other day and, uh, and reading one of the accounts in the, in the Old Testament. And again, it's like, wow, you know, God just moved and He just uh, did such things. And, uh, and amazing. But when we see about fearing God in Scripture, and we'll look at some other passages that concern that, but it talks having about having a revere for Him, having a deep respect for, understanding our place with our Heavenly Father, who our God is and what He does and where He's at. And it's not that we come to a place of God being our big buddy and friend that we still see God as who He is and that God is our, our Heavenly Father, that He is our Creator, that He is, again, uh, the one who uh, authorized our salvation, gave His only Son, Jesus, to die on the cross. We see God for all that He is, still understanding that the Scripture is true, that God loved us in such a way, that God did all, all those things for us and moved on our behalf. But it should give us, hopefully, a respect for him and a revere for him. Job feared God. You know, uh, in the book of Proverbs, when Solomon writes concerning uh, the wisdom that God would give him, one of the first things he would write in chapter 1 and verse 7, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So Solomon sets people apart and he says, uh, The foolish go away from the things of God. But those who are going to be wise and those who are going to learn, they fear the Lord. And it's one of the beginning things. And to have a fear of God, a respect for, and an understanding of who God is, and to revere Him. Job had that in his life. Proverbs chapter 8, I'll read you a couple of more Proverbs concerning that same subject and topic. Because you'll find, uh, you'll find that word throughout Proverbs. You'll find, a, again, sort of a discussion of that. But in chapter 8 and verse 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. And so here Proverbs is talking about, and Solomon writes that if you have the fear of the Lord, it puts you on the opposite side where you should be against evil, pride, and those things of arrogance and things that are against God. So it puts us on the other side of that. That's where we want to be. So again, having a fear of God puts a separation in us from some of the things of the world. In chapter 14 of Proverbs, in verse 26 and verse 27, it says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and His children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. And so there, Proverbs tells us that, uh, again, because we fear God, we can have a refuge there. And again, it gives us uh, something away from this world because we find who our God is and we have a respect for Him, a love for Him because of what He did for us. Not fearing Him that God is out to take us out because God loves you this morning. And a fear of God, let us understand that when Scripture sees it. But Job feared God. And so, <coughs> again, some very interesting things said about him. He was, again, perfect, upright. He feared God. And the fourth one that we find, again, recorded in both of those verses, he eschewed evil. Uh, a little bit of an uh, older word we see, but as when you look it up, uh, it means to turn off, to decline, to depart from. In other words, Job decided in his life, if it's evil and God's against it, I'm against it. And if that's what God says in his word, and this is bad, I want to be away from that. Oh, that we might have a little more eschewing evil uh, in the day and age in which we live among Christian folks, that they might name some things evil. Today, we don't want to call too much evil. Uh, we don't want to define sin as sin. We don't want to uh, define it according to God's word. And so uh, a lot of standards and uh, sort of a way of living and uh, holiness, as I preached on some of those things a few months ago or within the last month and a half, some of those things, uh, we don't have a lot of that in Christianity today. It's not popular preaching. It's sort of like, well, let's just accept everything. 
No, the Bible says if God declared it as evil, that Job put it out of his life. He eschewed evil. Uh, he departed from that. He wanted to uh, decline that and to turn it off. He made a separation between those things in his life that were God said was evil. Job stood apart from that. You will see that word in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 in the New Testament, in verse 11. It says, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So God is against evil, and Job was against evil. And Job had aligned himself with the things of God. And so if this is all we looked at right here with these four things, because God said, have you considered him? Because Job was all of that. Job was something special. The state of his heart was something special. He was a perfect, upright man who feared God, who eschewed evil, put it out of his life. But I'm going to look at three more qualities that I think he had as well. And then we hope to draw a little bit of a conclusion about those things as we move through these last three sort of quickly as well. Job was called a servant by God. I think that that was part of a, a heart condition as well. You know, we find within the Word of God those that take on the form of a servant. You actually find those people who were servants. By that, they served in a the household. They did something that were defined as servants uh, in the Bible. They had a place of what they did, and they served people. Uh, we find also that there are those uh, in the ministry. We define sometimes what we do as servants and serving people, and hopefully people who want to work in the ministry, want to work uh, in the things of God. They have a servant's heart, we call it. God called Job. He said, my servant Job. He looked at him as somebody who again had that uh, to serve. They had an idea to work, to serve, to labor for those things. Job was considered a servant. Our Lord Jesus Christ took upon him the form of a servant. He had a servant's heart. There was nothing at all wrong about that. You know, when we, uh, when we look at that and we think, oh, that you and I might desire the qualities that Job had in his life. Those first four would be great that we might have that, that we could say, oh, we're perfect and upright. And again, perfect. I still think I have to define that word every time I say it because I think people just sort of cringe back at it a little bit. He wasn't sinlessly perfect. Again, he was perfect in God's eyes. Perfect, upright, feared God, eschewed evil. But he was a servant. Oh, may we as believers be servants of God. May we desire to serve others through him. And may we have a servant's heart and by that, just meaning to do what's necessary as God leads us and as He would have us to, to have a servant's heart. What a quality that was. I just wanted to point it out because God called Job a servant. And He said, have you considered my servant Job? I think it's a heart quality. And I think it stands out. The last two is where we get to turn to other places in our Bible, but the book of Job. The two other places that you'll find His name recorded. And so often when you study somebody and you want to look at who they are in the Bible, you want to find out some things about them, it's always interesting to, um, to maybe look and see where else their name's recorded in the Bible, to see who talks about them. Some ways that uh, we look at it, uh, it's especially interesting if uh, the Lord Jesus Christ ever quotes from them, if He ever uses illustrations about people, and as He did so often in His preaching, He would speak of some of the Old Testament uh, uh, names and uh, those folks that lived there in uh, the Old Testament times, and Jesus would use them as a, an illustration and something he would do. We don't necessarily find Jesus using Job's name, but we find somebody else, uh, a couple other writers using that. One of them, the prophet Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, when he was uh, uh, writing and he was concerning some things, uh, about some things, he mentioned Job in pretty good company with some other folks in Ezekiel chapter 14. And twice, and he'll mention the name of Job in verse 14, he says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls for the righteousness, for their righteousness, saith the Lord God. And then also, I'm just going to skip down because in verse 20, it says, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. And here we look at and we just see that Joel, Job was righteous. And he was mentioned with these other men. Ezekiel very well could have lived in about the same time frame as the prophet Daniel. Uh, a little different areas, but they very well could have known that. Daniel could have maybe actually lived during some of that time. Noah and Job were just known of by Ezekiel the prophet, probably because he had 
some of the scrolls and the scriptures and, and that they had at that time. He knew of those folks. He knew of Noah and he knew of his faith. He knew of Job and he knew of his faith and he defined them as righteous. And he said that in their righteousness. Now, let us understand some things when we speak of this, that Job had a righteous heart to his heart and uh, the state of his heart and one of those things that we might could have even put that first. I uh, sort of just put it down at the end, just looking to study, uh, because when we look at this, this is what he needed most. But we can see that he did have a relationship with the Lord, but he was righteous. Job walked with the Lord and had a relationship with him. But how did that come? When we say that he was righteous, uh, because here it speaks of a righteousness that he contained within itself, and it put him with two great men of faith, Noah and the prophet Daniel. How could Job have some righteousness that he had? What made him have that righteousness before God where he was right within that? I'm going to turn back to the book of Job and turn a little forward uh, in the book of Job because we have a verse, uh, you know, so often we look and uh, we think of the Old Testament writers and uh, sometimes we see pictures that are pretty clear of the things to come and oh, that they, you know, we sometimes wonder at their understanding of the Messiah, the things that were going to happen on this earth. Job gives one verse within the middle of his book that gives us an understanding that Job understood much more than maybe what we sometimes give Old Testament saints credit for. In Job chapter 19 and verse 25, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job had a Redeemer. That's why he could say that, and Ezekiel could write that he was righteous. It wasn't talking about his own righteousness. Job wasn't self-righteous. He just knew that he had a redeemer. And the only reason he would have a redeemer is he had one who would make him righteous by his own stake. A redeemer buys somebody back. We see that word sort of expounded uh, a little more in the, uh, the account with uh, Ruth and Boaz. Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Jesus Christ becomes our redeemer because of what he does. He literally buys us and purchases us, removes us from sale because he paid our price on the cross of Calvary. Job, through spiritual eyes, knew that the Messiah would come. He may not have knew all the uh, accounts and uh, things that we have in the New Testament as those haven't been lived yet by Christ, but he knew that there was one to come. He looked forward to the cross and forward to the Messiah of the one who would come. But he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And in order for the Redeemer to go through that, Job understood the resurrection. I don't know all about uh, maybe everything that he understood and what his scope of that was, but this verse implies that Job understood that he had a Redeemer who was alive and he had a Redeemer who was going to live and that his Redeemer was going to stand in the latter day upon the earth. Job even seen the coming kingdom of Christ and things that we have yet to see that we look forward to because someday in the latter day, our King will come and reign in his throne from Jerusalem. And we look forward. And someday, our Redeemer who lives, and what a great thing that is, that same Redeemer will stand in the latter day upon the earth. And we can say that with Joel, Job. But that's what made him righteous because it wasn't righteousness he had on his own. But Job walked with the Lord. He had a relationship with him. I put it in order because we went to another book. And we looked at where Job was written. One last place in your Bible. One more quality we look at. And then we'll draw a conclusion about that and about the life of Job. James chapter 5. The only place in the New Testament that you'll find the name of Job written. Uh, and James writes concerning him. And interestingly enough, James is writing uh, concerning going through some trials and things of uh, the early church and what they will face and some temptations. And James writes in chapter 5 and verse 11, he says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Job had patience. You know, one of those things that sometimes gets quoted about him because this particular verse, people will talk and refer to the patience of Job. And uh, Job would come out and of course to be patient, to abide, to endure, uh, to suffer. Job was maybe called to do a number of those things. And he was given some things that were very hard, if you might say, in his life. He lost his personal possessions. 
He lost his family and family which he loved. Matter of fact, we can look at his spiritual side if we took time, his righteousness. Notice in chapter 1 how he sacrificed for his family, how he tried to intercede for his family. He prayed for his family. He did all he could for them because he thought they could have done something wrong. And again, it goes back to Old Testament economy there. But Job was sacrificing and doing those things because he was a family man. He was trying to be righteous for his family. He was trying to do all that he could to again help them. Job walked with the Lord, and yet God would allow him to go through some things. Again, his family taken away, his possessions taken away, his health taken away after that, all that he would do. And yet we have recorded that Job had patience. Oh, could that be said of us as we walk through the trials and the temptations of this life? Matter of fact, are we worthy to be tried as Job is? Most of us would uh, fit the, uh, the requirements above. Hopefully we're righteous, not on our own, but because we know the Lord, we've trusted in Him as our Savior. It's our only hope of heaven. As I have a Redeemer, realize that God did love us. He gave His Son Jesus to die for us. And by trusting Him on the cross of Calvary and His finished work there, His resurrection, that you and I can have a, a home in heaven, our sins forgiven. We can be righteous. Hopefully we've done that. Matter of fact, if you haven't, you need to know the Lord today to be righteous. Some of us might say, well, I've tried to serve the Lord. I want to be a servant. I want to do those things. Hopefully we come to a place where we want to serve Him because He saved us. Maybe we could... Say, well, I've put off some evil in my life. Hopefully we have a, a more definitions as we go closer to the Lord. We define what's uh, evil and what's right. And we put those things that are evil out of our lives. Maybe we eschew some evil. Probably should do some more of that. Hopefully we fear God and we have a respect of Him. And hopefully we uh, revere Him. And we, we have that wisdom and knowledge that comes from knowing who God is and our place. And we fear Him. Hopefully we're upright and we're righteous and again, straight before God and doing things the right way. Hopefully we can be said that we're perfect in the eyes of God, complete in Him, and that we're living for Him. We're trying to follow Him. We're not missing any of the pieces, but we're trying to serve Him completely. But oh, that last quality of Job's heart, that he was patient and had patience in trial, patience in suffering, patience in what God placed upon him. That may be the toughest out of all of those. But yet God said that Job had it. James writes and records the half-brother of Christ as he gives some of these things about prayer. And matter of fact, if you consider all this passage, prayer, healing, and some of the things going on there that James is talking about and the suffering of that, but he says the patience of Job, the willingness to abide and to endure and to suffer, to take the things that God gave to him in his life and realize that it came at the hand of God and God's going to see me through it. And He's going to work with me in my life because He's making me as gold. He's trying me, but He's molding and He's pushing and maybe heating a little bit and forming something that is a little raw and a little rough. And He's making it into something precious and something more precious. I think that the character of Job stands out as one of those great qualities and people we find in the Word of God that bore qualities such as this. He was worthy to have these great trials placed upon him. And that's why Satan came and said, oh, you know, what are we doing? We're challenging people. We're accusing the brethren. We're doing that. And God said, have you considered my servant, Job? That's why he was thrown out there, so to speak, as we might say, well, God threw him to the wolves. No, God knew he could handle the test. God wanted to make something different out of him. And because of all of that, you and I have the inspiration from the Word of God about this man named Job who bore all these qualities, but he had patience to deal with what God placed in his life. Oh, as we think of Job, as we consider him this morning, the state of Job's heart, Where's our heart at? Many of us, we face trials in this life. Maybe not all the ones that Job faced. Some may be sort of uh, similar this and that. All of them maybe fall in the same line. Where do we fall at having the state of Job's heart? Do we have patience in trial? That's the tough one sometimes. But do we have the other things he had? I hope we're righteous. I hope we know the Lord. But are we upright? Are we perfect? Do we try to serve God the way He'd have us to?
May we, may we be worthy to be tried as Job was. Oh, what a blessing it would be. A little bit that we can learn from this man named Job. He was called to suffer, but the state of his heart made him very unique and something special in the eyes of God. May we learn from that today. Let us stand with our heads bowed as we close.